Welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. My name is Daniel Murphy, and I'm assistant editor of the journal. If you are new to these podcasts, please visit the Florida Historical Quarterly on Facebook, where you can now access abstracts of each article in the current issue of the journal. In 2016, the FHQ is continuing its publication of a series of six special issues in recognition of the quincentennial of Ponce de Leon's first visit to Florida in 1513. Our next special issue, covering Florida history between 1870 and 1920, will be guest edited by John David Smith, professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Please look forward to publication of this issue in late 2016. Today's podcast features an interview with Brad Massey, a PhD candidate at the University of Florida and instructor of history at Polk State College. In the interview, Brad and I discuss his article titled The Hammer, the Sickle, and the Phosphate Rock, the 1974 Political Controversy over Florida Phosphate Shipments to the Soviet Union, which was published in the spring 2016 issue of the FHQ. Please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your academic background. My name is Brad Massey, and I'm an instructor of history at Polk State College. I have a master's degree in history from George Mason University, and I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Florida. Also, in the summer of 2015, I was a Reardon Research Fellow at the University of South Florida Special Collections. In your in the upcoming issue of the uh, Florida Historical Quarterly, you have a, a fascinating article on the phosphate industry. Uh, I study Florida history, but I know very little about the phosphate industry in Florida. Can you just give us an overview of the phosphate industry in Florida up to the 1970s? Yes. Um in the late 1800s, large phosphate deposits, um, and most of this phosphate is used in fertilizer production, were discovered in Florida. And in short order, phosphate extraction, manufacturing, and transporting became really big business in the state. But in the early decades, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, the industry has been described as in a period of boom, bust, experimentation, mismanagement, and inefficiency. And labor was always a problem in the early industry. So convict labor was used in the mines. And in particular, many black Floridians found themselves laboring in the phosphate mines during their sentences. And a lot of this early mining was very crude. I mean, you had crews that got in there and they extracted phosphate rock with pickaxes and shovels. They put it in wheelbarrows and they hauled it up. And what you also had was the creation of a couple phosphate company towns, and these are towns that American coal miners probably would have been familiar with. These towns had their own recreation centers, grocery stores, sometimes company script. But what happens later on in the 1920s and 30s is the phosphate industry expands as technology expands, and particularly the use of drag lines in the strip mining processes um, laid the groundwork for increased phosphate profits and productions, um, particularly after World War II. So what happens is after the war, the company towns, convict labor, these lower worker wages, they all start to disappear as the phosphate companies become more profitable. And in the 1950s, they also expand into a more wide-ranging global marketplace. Um, you have Florida phosphate rock being sent to Korea, being sent to Japan, being sent to Western Europe, being sent to Canada. So at the same time that Florida has these booming post-war suburbs, these um, roadside attractions of the 50s and 60s, phosphate becomes the third biggest industry in the state behind tourism and agriculture. And as the industry grows in the 50s and 60s, there also becomes this concern over air and water pollution. Um, there's some dam breaks where phosphate ponds dump their waste into the Peace River in the 1960s, causing widespread fish kills. Um, fertilizing and ma phosphate manufacturing places are also emitting air pollution, which is sickening, some farmers are saying, is sickening their cattle and their orange groves. So you have this concern over pollution as you have this growing industry. But by the 1970s, Florida is providing about one-third of the world's phosphate, and it's employing directly or indirectly upwards of 60,000 people. So the industry is in Florida to stay. Uh, again, that's fascinating because I, I don't think many people realize how big a long-term impact phosphates really had in the state, or the phosphate industries had in the state. So you get to the 70s. Um, how does this phosphate industry entangle Florida in the Cold War? So after World War II, as I was talking about, phosphate mining and manufacturing is growing dramatically. 
And of course, when an industry grows, there's always this want for new markets. And the new market after 1973 for phosphate ends up being the Soviet-centered Eastern Bloc. And it's really interesting, the backstory, because what you have is you have a businessman named Dr. Armin Hammer, who is the head of a company called the Occidental Oil Company. And Hammer had long ties to the Soviet Union. His father was one of the founders of the American Communist Labor Party. And in the mid-1920s, Armin finds himself in the Soviet Union attempting to do deals with Lenin and deals with the Soviet um, elites at the time. And what happens is Hammer goes to the Soviet Union, and he does successfully broker a series of deals. And these are deals that involve numerous American businesses, including the Ford Motor Company. And what the Soviet Union really wants in the 1920s is U.S. tractors, U.S. machinery, um, U.S. equipment for their agricultural and their other enterprises. And Hammer spends most of his um, – most of the 1920s in the Soviet Union, and he leaves in the 1930s um, during the early years of Stalinization, but even then he continues his Soviet business deals. And so the irony of all this is very interestingly, Dr. Armin Hammer becomes an extremely wealthy American capitalist in large part through these deals with the Soviet Union. So then later on after World War II, something very interesting is going to happen. Um, when Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev decides that the Soviets need phosphate for their agricultural endeavors, what happens is, is in 1961, he summons Hammer to the Kremlin. And they sit down, and Hammer agrees to try to bring Florida phosphate to the Soviet Union. So what he does throughout the 1960s is he transforms his Occidental Oil Company, and he turns it from an oil company into an oil and phosphate company. And what he does is in the 1960s, he starts to acquire Florida lands, and he also starts to acquire existing phosphate companies. So, for example, Occidental purchases the International Ore and Fertilizer Company, which at the time was the third largest fertilizer company in the United States, uh, the Best Fertilizer Company, the Jefferson Lake Sulphur Company, and the Hooker Chemical Company. And so what he's doing is he's trying to get Occidental involved in the phosphate industry so he can send phosphate to the Soviet Union. So while he's doing these things, though, in the 1960s, the environment for Soviet U.S. business deals is not good. Um, of course, he meets with Khrushchev in 1961. After that, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then we have Vietnam. But with the election of Nixon and the pursuit of detente with Kissinger, what happens is Hammer finds that in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the business climate has become more favorable. And that's when the Occidental Soviet deal is developed. And when the deal is publicized, it, and it was, the public was told it involved $400 million and 80 million tons of Florida phosphate. And part of the financing was a $180 million loan from the Export-Import Bank. And again, sort of like his earlier business deals, there's many American corporations that are involved, including the Bank of America. And what this deal is going to do is it's going to make Florida phosphate truly global, not just farms in Korea, Japan, Canada, Western Europe. I mean, now Florida phosphate is also going to be in the Eastern Bloc, and it's going to be tied to – the socialist economies of the world. And also, it's not just Florida phosphate going out. There's going to be Soviet imports coming in, particularly ammonia. So what we have is a back-and-forth trade deal. So phosphate is going to go out. It's going to end up in the Soviet Union, also in Cuba sugar farms via the Comic-Con. Ammonia is going to come in. There's going to be investments in the Ukraine. Occidental is going to build infrastructure there, but also in Florida the port of Jacksonville, the port of Tampa, and obviously the phosphate mining um, lands. But even though the deal gets signed, it still becomes a, political, a politically contentious issue at times. Um, for example, when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, Carter blocks phosphate shipments. Later on, when Reagan is elected, he rescinds that embargo, following through on a promise he made to the American agricultural industry. And so what you have is phosphate becomes – during this period, a very important commodity that ties Florida to the geopolitical Cold War order. There's a lot of things going on there then. I, I, I'm sure 
most people don't know Hammer's influence in Florida, especially uh, this buying up of land. But and, and you kind of talk about it. There's a lot of contention here in a lot of different ways. I guess the question then is, how many Floridians were, were aware that this, this was going on, especially the the contract with the Soviet Union, and how did they feel about it? What, what were their thoughts on this? Well, uh, it depended on where you stood on the issue. A lot of Floridians were unhappy with it, particularly those that felt they were already being influenced by phosphate pollution. So heading up to the deal, some of the, resident, the residents of Sun City Center, they were unhappy that they felt that their water source might be tapped in by the phosphate industry, even though ultimately – the phosphate that was destined for the Soviet Union didn't come from that area of Florida. There were these concerns. Other Floridians that were unhappy were those that were concerned over peak phosphate. Um, like peak oil theorists, peak phosphate theorists said that what's going to happen, and some of them were predicting this would happen in the 1980s, is that U.S. phosphate production would peak and then it would start to go into decline. And with that in mind, it didn't make sense to send phosphate to the Soviet Union, um, the nation's ideological nemesis. There were other people that were unhappy because there were rumors swirling that Florida and Moroccan producers, phosphate producers, had agreed behind the scenes to set phosphate prices. And Morocco was also obviously a large phosphate producer, and so a lot of industry critics, when they saw that the price of phosphate had been going up and up and up, they said, well, there must be some type of behind-the-scenes deal going on where phosphate is going to make itself a cartel. And interestingly, Dr. Hammer, his Occidental Oil Company, was also charged with emboldening OPEC in the 1960s. Um, one thing Occidental did was it signed a unilateral deal to get oil from Libya's Omar Gaddafi at the time. And a lot of people said by doing that, Occidental broke with standard oil industry practice, and it was emboldening OPEC. And so then their reasoning went, well, if they were going to embolden OPEC, why would they not then go and then set phosphate prices? So there's all these, these ideas that are swirling at the time. Um, perhaps, though, the most well-known Florida opponent was Richard Stone, who was Florida Secretary of State when the deal was announced, and then shortly thereafter, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. And Stone's really interesting because he makes a series of arguments that tie together some of the various threads of phosphate industry criticism, and he kind of – he melts them into what I call a nationalistic form of Occidental Soviet deal criticism. And there's basically – there's multiple things that Stone argues, but he really focuses on four points. The first one is he makes the argument that phosphate should be reserved for domestic use. Thus, he shares these same ideas with these peak phosphate theorists. Secondly, he argues the Florida environment should not be damaged to send a vital element to the Soviets. The phosphate industry was known to extract a lot of water from the Florida aquifer. They had started recycling water by the late 1970s, but there was this continuing concern about water consumption and also water and air pollution. Thirdly, Stone argued that the Soviets could potentially weaponize the phosphate. They could make tracer bullets and these other things. And during congressional testimony, Stone is, um, Stone's assertion is backed up by a Florida State professor who says that you know, these things are a possibility. And fourth, and this is one of the things that seemed to really drive Senator Stone crazy, was the export-import bank loan for $180 million that was part of the financing. He continuously argued he, that he didn't understand why the Soviets could secure a loan at 6% interest when American taxpayers were having to pay approximately 10% interest, because this was in the 1970s, an era of very high interest rates. So he said, why in the world should the Export-Import Bank give favorable terms to the Soviets? He said this again and again. So those were the criticisms, but of course there were some Floridians that defended the deal. Um, one of the obvious ones was well, Dr. Armin Hammer. I mean, he said in congressional testimony that the Occidental Soviet deal actually made the world safer. He also points out that a lot of American allies already had deals with the Soviets. You know, some of our allies in Asia, some of our allies during the Cold War in Western Europe already had business deals with the Soviets. Thus, why shouldn't the United States? And then during his congressional testimony, he makes this really interesting statement, which I think is worth quoting. What he says is, the alternatives are far too awful to contemplate. 
fear, famine, pestilence, small wars, more Vietnams, cold wars, and even the potential for nuclear war. So with that said, Armand Hammer says these tr this transnational business deal and deals like it will make the world safer. But along with Armand Hammer, most phosphate industry industry people, both those that worked in the industry, those that worked in phosphate company management, they supported the deal because they were on the lookout for new markets. And as I said before, you have over 60,000 that are directly or indirectly employed by the industry, and a lot of these people obviously support the deal. And when the Soviet Union disbands, and in the, the mid-1980s when prices of phosphate go down, you do see a lot of these jobs disappear. So they had good reason, um, the reason being their own personal economic, economic interest to support the deal. Well, so different interests with different perspectives across the board here. So, um, and I don't know how much of the, the, the conclusion you want to give away, but what eventually happens, and for Floridians today, is there any kind of long-term impact or consequences on the state today? Well, what eventually happens in my article is that the phosphate deal ends up going through. There is a hiatus with the Carter, the Carter blockage of phosphate shipments because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan between uh, 1979 and 1981. But Reagan comes in and he allows the phosphate exchanges to continue. And they'll continue really until the demise of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union disbands in the late 1980s. As far as the consequences of Florida today, I think there's a few major consequences. I mean, the first are the environmental consequences. And this doesn't have to do with just the Soviet Occidental deal, but because during the Cold War you had these high phosphate profits and this high phosphate demand, obviously more Florida land was strip mined. There were more phosphate pollutants. So there was an environmental impact during Cold War era phosphate production. I mean, if you look at an aerial photo of the state using any type of mapping software, especially in the southern, the, the central Florida southern areas of the state around Bartow and Lakeland, if you look south, I mean, you can see those phosphate um, ponds and you can see the environmental impact that the phosphate industry has had. One of the other consequences is, you know, the phosphate industry, because of some of the pollutants during the Cold War era, it does spike env environmental action. So Florida Defenders of the Environment is one group that gets really involved. Ultimately, there is a blockage of phosphate extraction in the Osceola National Forest, which President Reagan supports. Um, the industry does start recycling better, and it does cut its pollutants. So one of the consequences is this environmental reaction to the industry. Also, I mean, one thing about the industry, and this is related to the environment, is it clearly becomes very concerned with building a positive public image. And we see this even today with the advertising campaigns of Mosaic, which is now the largest Florida phosphate producer. You know, this attempt to explain the pub to the public what the phosphate companies do. And, you know, Mosaic talks a lot about how obviously it provides fertilizer for the world. It likes to talk about stream song as uh, evidence that Florida phosphate mining lands can be reclaimed. So I think what we see is this attempt by phosphate companies to try to better communicate with the public um, the message that they want to communicate with them. And then lastly, and this isn't probably so much a consequence as it is the phosphate industry being part of a certain historical trend, and that's this. The phosphate industry, particularly the Occidental Soviet deal because of that export-import bank loan, it gets criticized for being sort of one of these companies that supports this notion of globalization through economic ties. You know, we see criticisms of the Export-Import Bank today. In the, in the current presidential campaign, you know, we see attacks on trade deals and we see attacks on globalism. And clearly in the 1970s, during the, t the period of this article in the 1960s, the phosphate industry is involved in global trade. It's using the Export-Import Bank. So I think Florida phosphate was part of that, and it continues to be part of that conversation. So once again, the, the Florida's past intersects with its uh, present pretty pretty clearly. Uh, this is fascinating. I've read it several times. I'm going to go back and read it again now that we've talked.
But is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about your article or your research in general? When it comes to this article, I would just like Floridians to keep in mind how influential the phosphate industry was to Florida post-war growth and to the Florida environment. Um, just a quick st statistic, the Florida Phosphate Council reported that the industry spent $1.26 billion in infrastructure in the 1970s, which was a sum that was 2.5 times more than the cost of Walt Disney World. So when even though we think of post-war Florida as being a place of obviously expanding suburbs and tourism, and which we should because those are obviously very important to the narrative of post-war history, I'd like us Floridians to keep in mind that Florida was also a place of heavy industry, and I think we forget about that a lot. And the truth be told, I've taught Florida history in the past, and I haven't even mentioned the phosphate industry, because I just don't think it comes to mind when we think about Florida. But the phosphate industry has been very influential. Um, you know, one example is the infamous Skyway Bridge tragedy, where a ship hit the Skyway Bridge and it collapsed. Well, that was a phosphate ship, um, the Summit Venture. A lot of people don't realize that, and that's obviously a very striking example, but it's also an example of how Florida phosphate has shaped the history of the state. Just just kind of a, a, a impromptu question here, I guess. Um, how What's it been like for you as a uh, historian of Florida to do research in, in the state? Have you found it to be easy, hard, somewhere in between? Um, I found that one of the good things about doing research in the state is there's a lot of interested parties that provide a lot of help. So, for example, I opened up talking about the, the Reardon um, Fellowship, and I've had a great experience at the University of South Florida. They have a great archive there, and the staff has been very helpful. Also, because I do a lot of stuff in the phosphate industry, I also use the downtown library a lot because they have a great newspaper clipping file, which I would recommend to anyone that's interested in post-war Tampa history because there's certain newspapers in Tampa that weren't digitized, and those things are literally clipping files that are keyword indexed in envelopes. So I guess my answer to your question is I have found it easy as long as you find the knowledgeable people that can help to point you in the right direction. But I'll also say one of the great things about doing it research in Florida is that the more that I do, the more that I find that there's a lot of historical occurrences and phenomenon like um, this article and, the, and about the phosphate industry that historians still haven't covered. And that makes me very excited for myself and for everyone that's um, writing Florida history nowadays because I still think there's a lot of things about the state that historians have yet to uncover, and it really gives a great opportunity well, um, your article is a great testament to the good stuff you're doing. Please keep doing this kind of research. We need more of it. Uh, Brad, thanks a lot for talking to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast of the Florida Historical Quarterly. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in the state of Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you have enjoyed the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast and that you would consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. We also invite researchers to access back issues of the Florida Historical Quarterly on JSTOR. Thank you again for listening to the Florida Historical Quarterly podcast. If you enjoy listening to this interview and know of others who enjoy history, please tell them about the podcast and have them find us on Facebook.